Welcome back to the channel, everybody. As promised, I have a very important guest today. This is JT Invests in You. He's an Al he's the governor for the Algorand ecosystem. Say hi, JT. How you doing, everybody? I appreciate you taking the time to uh, invite me on your show. Yes, I, I've been kind of meaning to do it for a while now, and then I just thought, okay, this week I don't have anyone else. The World Cup is kicking off Sunday. Yep. Algorand's a big sponsor. I'm like, now's the time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the World Cup, I believe, what, starts on the 20th, I believe? So uh, about two days from the time of recording this? Yep, Qatar, Ecuador. So right, one day from when this airs, is going to be one day. So it's good. Nice, beautiful. Um, yeah, and then my interviews uh, sort of off topic here, but they've been going very well. The first guest I had on the show here, some of my viewers might remember this crew here, Entropy and Jose from Entropy. So they actually just announced uh, just yesterday that they got that they were accepted into the Binance Labs incubator program. One of thirteen companies of nine hundred total applicants. Congratulations to them! That's two hundred fifty thousand dollars of funding they get. And then I noticed that that video we shot it six weeks ago it was getting a bunch of views on Wednesday, like 100, 150 views. Not really a big deal. Wouldn't have thought too much about. It. I thought maybe like you were looking at that to see my interview style. So apparently the Binance crew was watching the video then. Right. I mean, it's possible, and uh, and. It in all honesty, I think it's going to be very, really interesting. I know you're going to ask about it in the future, but uh, you know, Algorand's Decipher is coming up in about uh, two to three weeks, and they actually have a panel with the uh, executive director of Binance. So it's not CZ, but uh, whoever the executive director is, I can't think of the name offhand, but really curious on how that conversation is going to go, especially with all of the fallout with FTX and how Binance was involved to some degree with the selling of FTT token. Uh, so that should be a really interesting conversation. Yeah, why don't we actually start right into that there? So there, Algorand has their Decipher 2022 conference. It's in 10 days, the 28th. It's in Dubai. Last year, it was in Miami. It's not just limited to Algorand companies. It's also other ecosystem companies. Now, they originally had Sam Bankman-Fried speaking. It was a big announcement three three weeks ago before all this went down. Then <clears throat> he appeared to be uh, uninvited, it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's the news of the day that he has been officially un uninvited for sure. Right. So, uh, Stacey Warden, she's the CEO of Algorand Foundation. She put up a tweet like a week ago. Uh, no, Sam Bagafried will not be coming. Yeah, I um, mean, uh, no surprise there at this point. I mean, there is a small part of me that is just like so curious what he would say in public. But yeah, no, he shouldn't be there. I mean, we'll 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 leave it at that. It's too bad because it was a big deal when when they right. got him because he, he doesn't really have any direct connections to the Algorand ecosystem, not really. Um, no, like, which, which in a way, I guess we uh, well, I say we because I you know I'm a prominent men member of the ecosystem, but uh, Algorand as a whole kind of dodged a bullet because there's not too much money sloshing around from FTX or any of the sister companies that FTX was uh, sort of a part of, whether it be Alameda Research or any of the ones that received money underneath. So. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, relative to some other ecosystems, I mean, I think we kind of dodged a bullet there. Yeah, I think uh, the total exposure was only one million dollars that uh, Algorand had on FTX. So that's their total losses. So a one point nine billion dollar market cap, one million loss. That's that's about as close to zero exposure as you can get. So that's very good news. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's a tough, uh, tough scenario though, honestly, because uh, I know a lot of people in the ecosystem, myself included, were you know really hoping to see uh, USDC on Algorand be uh, included on exchanges like FTX, and they just recently announced that they were going to be adding support for USDC on Algorand. So a lot of the community was excited. I know a lot of people even left their Coinbase account to go over to FTX because the uh, you know because of this announcement. Uh, so on that note, that's a little sad, and I do hope to see other exchanges like maybe Binance or even Coinbase adding support for these ASAs, which would be fantastic. Uh, and it, it is kind of unfortunate that the first big exchange that did add support for USDC uh, on Algorand went bust uh, maybe three weeks after that, four weeks after. Yeah, that was a big announcement about three weeks ago. USDC was going to be launched on the Algorand blockchain, and then it was going to trade on FTX, which was kind of a big deal. So that's, I guess, where the $1 million in assets on FTX was, kind of like prepping that. But, you know, whatever. Minimal right. exposure, not bad. And then I think so. Anthony Scaramucci, he was also so he's been on your show. He was supposed to be speaking at Decipher. I'm not sure if he is anymore. I didn't see his name on the thing. I, but, but I think his hedge fund they it's they had a little bit of exposure to FTX, but they are by no means under. They have weathered the storm. Is that how you understand it? 
Yeah, I'm not really sure about that because I know that uh, Sam Bankman Freed uh, tried to get about 30% of Skybridge or did actually acquire 30% of Skybridge. So, from my understanding, Anthony Scaramucci was trying to buy that stake back from him. And I'm not really sure how that's going or how that will even be possible during bankruptcy proceedings. I'm really uh, unsure how that process goes. And uh, I will say, I feel like I spoke to him just like two weeks before that happened. So, it really would have been a great conversation. Uh, if I was able to get him uh, just after that, as opposed to before that. But uh, I don't know. I, I feel like he'll probably weather the storm. I'm sure, you know, he's probably got money elsewhere. I'm sure he's fine, but uh, I don't think it's great. I don't think it's good for him either way. It's not great. I'm not seeing any Twitter. So that's good. There's no Twitter silence from him. He's active on Twitter. Um, could be worse. I, I think they initially had some exposure either to Terra three or was capital on the May congestion. And then they got a bailout from FTX. So that's where they've had some troubles lately in the last couple of weeks. But yeah, I think they have weathered the storm. That's the thing that concerns me a little bit. You know, you just mentioned Luna and it took about maybe eight weeks or so, maybe even longer to actually uh, feel the full wrath of the contagion that came from that Luna fiasco. So I'm still very curious uh, what's going to come from this FTX fiasco? We've already been seeing a little bit of it with BlockFi and, uh, you know, even Gemini, well, not Gemini, the actual exchange, but their uh, lending platform is halting withdrawals and there's raising some questions with uh, GBTC, which I think might be a little unfounded questioning. But regardless, uh, I think there's going to be some follow over the next four to eight weeks that uh, it's kind of hard to predict. So I'm a little concerned about that and I've certainly got my eye on it. But uh, what are you going to do? It's yeah, BlockFi is completely done because they were sort of a double whammy. They were lending money for three hours capital, and then they had a lot of money on the FTX exchange. So they got hit from both ends. So at least it's no talk of even a bailout. They are just done completely. I mean, and they're not alone. I think I read that there was a Canadian pension fund, uh, teachers pension fund that had about $95 million on uh, or held up on FTX that they no longer have access to, which, uh, you know, sounds like a lot of money. It definitely is. When I read into it, I think it was like less than a percent of the uh, amount of money that had that the pension fund had as assets under management. So overall, they'll be fine. But that's the second pension fund that's caught that's a Canadian pension fund that's been caught up in a crypto disaster over the last like three to four months. And I, I find that pretty interesting, too. It was, yeah, the first pension fund he's talking about, they had 150 million in Celsius and this other pension right. fund. 95 million on FTX. So I, I yeah, I guess I, one thing that struck me, I guess Canadian pension funds are a little bit more aggressive with their uh, risk taking strategies than American pension funds are. Yeah, I mean, I, I you could take it that way. But I also wonder if it's also just a uh, product of leaner or, or more lenient regulation. So I'm not sure if pension funds in the United States are even able to invest in that way. So uh, uh, because I don't know, I'm not sure if they, you know, if they are just more aggressive by nature and culture or if it is just a product of the fact that they have the regulations that allow them to invest in those and we don't. It's yeah, I think it's two things. It's it is a little bit of that. So specifically Canada allowed exchange traded funds. The US still hasn't done that. Canada did their purpose fund. It's getting a lot of traffic. Like the Australia ones, they allowed them to, and they are not doing too well, but Canada's getting a lot of traffic. So I think that's sort of sent the green light. Pension funds, you can be a little bit more risky. And I think also Celsius had a lot of Toronto connections, I believe. They're a New York company, but I think they also had a Toronto office. I feel like the executives just kind of were in the same social circles. Right. Maybe. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, no, it's uh, it, I, I completely agree. And one of the other things, too, is you, know, you mentioned the exchange traded funds that can, uh, Canada has. Uh, the only thing that we have that's even close to that is GBTC, that uh, you know, Bitcoin trust held by Grayscale, which I believe is now trading about 43, 44% under NAV currently. So uh, the only real major product that we have here in the States is uh, not doing so well. So I'm really, I'm really hoping one day we get an actual ETF or mutual fund that allows crypto. But uh, I don't know, the way the regulation's looking and the way that we're going to have a divided Congress after this last election, I don't, I don't think anything's going to get done for a while. It's yeah, the SEC clearly has a bad relationship with grayscale. I don't think they're ever going to approve anything grayscale. I, I just don't think the two sides like each other. They do have a better relationship with ARK Invest. So they just the SEC just delayed, they didn't cancel, or reject, they just delayed ARK's latest uh, application for an ETF. So I feel like if one's going to be accepted, it's probably ARK. Yeah, I'll definitely keep an eye on that, but I'm not hopeful. I know uh, Scaramucci also had uh, you know, a couple attempts at trying to get an ETF there as well, or at least uh, I believe that's what I read. Uh, I don't know. It's 
it might be a long battle. I do. I am hopeful that it happens, but uh, it's going to be a snow, a slow, slow moving target in, in my opinion. So yeah, your prediction is no time close, which is what most people tend to think. Unfortunately, the way the government works, it's uh, it seems more likely than not that it's not going to be anytime soon. Probably, yeah, I was hoping since the Canada one got a lot of traction, maybe it would kind of carry over here. But that was like a beta test, in my opinion. But... I used to be more hopeful, but I'm becoming a I'm becoming a cynic. <laughs> yeah, at least we well we do know the announcement itself. Even if it doesn't get too much traction, the platform it will still. But even if it doesn't, the announcement is definitely going to be a huge positive momentum indicator right. of the market. I think it's just going to cause a huge pump that day. Well, that's the other thing too. I mean, there's people. I mean, I'm not a I'm not big on conspiracies, but there's people that theorize that the reason that they're putting off uh, an ETF of any sort is because they know it'll be a boom to the market. And right now, they're trying to keep asset prices down to tame inflation, so they don't want to do anything that's going to cause a boom to any of these markets. In fact, they're, they're really attempting to do the opposite. Yeah, it could, like with the inflation announcements, I know Jerome Powell, he is uh, he is a Republican. And so if he had lowered the, if he had raised the rates by an improved lesser amount of half a percent the last time, that probably would have favored the Democrats going into the, the midterm elections. So if he was going to raise it by a better improved rate, it would probably be the next time or two times, not right before the midterms. Yeah, I'm curious on how far we'll go with rate hikes too, because uh, you know, every time he signals a a target or you know a target area for rate hikes, it does seem like as the months progress, those targets uh, are moved a little bit. So I believe right now uh, everything's pricing in maybe another like fifty to hundred basis points, if I'm not correct, uh, if if I'm not mistaken. And I think we're going to go past that personally. I think they unless. Uh, inflation really has peaked and we had it come down to about 7.7 percent on the last reading which is still way too high uh i don't know i really think those rate hikes are going to come up higher than people expect in, in the markets pricing it so you're predicting kind of just still 0.75 percent that's what you're saying uh you know maybe maybe they'll bring them down to 50 basis point hikes but i don't think they're going to stop as soon as people do okay could very well be and let's uh shift gears a little bit so we have a new contender for hedge fund blow up of the year. This news kind of just broke yesterday, multi-coin capital. Uh, supposedly they, they lost 55% of their total asset value in the last two weeks. It was a mix of, uh, they had some money on FTX exchange. They owned a lot of FTT tokens as long-term investments. They were best buddies with the whole FTX crew. They also were early investors in Solana, which got wrecked in the last few weeks and just the market downturn in general. But I mean, losing 55% two weeks, Jesus. Yeah, do you know how much? Uh, do you know how many uh, assets they had under management, or how much uh, that drop was? Like, what was it at before it fell fifty five percent? I seen a false tweet. They were supposedly was false for around nine hundred million dollars. What they lost, but there was that was not backed up. That was quoted from like a Fortune magazine article, which these people were questioning their sources. I, it's so hard because since like prices of Bitcoin fluctuate so much, it's so hard to know at any given time what the net assets and value is. But still, fifty five percent when the market's only down about twenty percent pretty bad right right and they are a big player and it's uh, that that just goes back to what i was saying that it's a uh, going to be really interesting to see what the level of contagion is from this fiasco because uh you know we can conceptualize like all right cool these uh this firm went down this firm went down whatever but how like where do the tentacles of these firms uh reach out to and how many projects are going to go under because that money evaporated and that uh is yet to be seen i mean we're seeing it a little bit like you mentioned in the solana ecosystem which has been wrecked but I, I still think we're we're near we're near the tip of the iceberg as opposed to uh, seeing the the greater picture. Yeah, I think going forward, you're going to be hearing when you talk about projects doing your due diligence. One of the key factors is going to be had zero exposure to FTX or anything like that. Like I'm promoting that with Algorand, one million dollars total. It's like point oh 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 one percent. So I think that's going to be a key variable going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it just kind of gives you the peace of mind that, uh, especially if this bear market's going to be uh, long lasting, that the projects that people are excited about have longevity, because that's really, in my opinion, what every project should be striving for right now. You can you can get out product features and all these other cool bells and whistles. Uh, but if you don't have the money to get to the end of the bear market, it, I mean, uh, what are you going to do even with all those bells and whistles? So I, I think that's the name of the game currently. And of course, it's going to bode well for those projects that haven't been too exposed to a lot of these crypto fiascos. Which, yeah, it's a good point because three euros capital, even though it had a lot of hoopla, it was only created about a year and a half ago in 2021. But Multicoin was around since 2017. They were an old school right. player. 
So, but yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of people just don't like multi-coin. If you look in the Twitter comment section of any tweet announcing their down, I mean, people just seem to be like celebrating with I, the three arrows capital guys look like saints compared to the multi-coin guys. Uh, I, people just don't like them. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's one of those things that it's unfortunate that the crypto market had to go through these uh, troubling times, but. Uh, to a degree, as the old saying goes, when the, when the tide goes out, you get to see who's swimming naked. And uh, it, it it was sort of time to wash away some of the uh, bad actors in the space. And it is really unfortunate that retail is always the one that gets hurt the most uh, during these, uh, you know, washes of bad actors. But uh, I will say it probably had to happen for the next uh, for the next cycle to continue, you know. Yeah. The sort of cleansing of the guard, washing out. Right. Um, now let's talk. So you're a, a governor for Algren. So what exactly does that entail? Yeah, and actually, full disclosure, because I actually not that I got hit that hard, but I needed some liquidity. So I actually dropped out of governance because I need to sell a little bit. But uh, I'll, I'll you know come back to that caveat, and I'll say that Algren governance is fantastic. It's in its five. It's in its fifth period so far. And this is the first one I've ever had to drop out of, unfortunately. And it's because I didn't follow my own rule, which I'll get back to as well. Uh, but Algorand governance is this thing where you essentially lock up your tokens for about three months and commit to voting on proposals within the Algorand ecosystem. So they could be anything from, uh, you know, creating a creator fund where they uh, want to create a fund to buy NFTs within the community. They could be a creator, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it could be proposals like there are right now to allocate algos to DeFi protocols to incentivize the growth and use of DeFi, which is fantastic. Uh, really could be whatever, especially because they just uh, created or they're in the process of creating this XGov process, which creates essentially a bunch of little XGov DAOs. And you could become an ex-governor essentially just by being a long-standing governor within the Algorand ecosystem. And then you'd have the ability to create proposals and vote on these proposals as well. So uh, governance is anything you want it to be in theory. If it's, you know, it's a, a political tug and war between the community on various proposals. And uh, so far, I think it's going fantastic. But uh, yeah, going back to my... Hmm, going back to what I was saying before and why I had to drop out, I did need a little bit of that money. And unfortunately, what I always tell people to do when they want to join governance is join with like two or three wallets. Because if you if you go under the amount you commit, you're ineligible for rewards. So if you if you need to use that money, use it. If you want to access governance, I say you should do it with two or three wallets. So that way, if you have to access some money, you know, two of your wallets are still eligible while one might not be, which I didn't do that. I didn't follow my own rules. And now I'm inel ineligible. <laughs> So you have to maintain a certain like stake in your wallet, basically, to keep having the governance voting. Exactly. So I mean, it's it's a similar, it's a proof of stake protocol. So it's similar to that concept where, yeah, uh, for about three months at a time, you commit a stake to the governance protocol. Uh, well, I say protocol, but it's essentially a soft lock. So you're still keeping your tokens in your wallet, uh, although there's some caveats to that as well because there are some DeFi vaults you can use through apps like Algo Vault, where you can still access governance but have access to uh, your funds as well and be able to leverage them. But that's a whole nother story. So essentially. You commit your algos for three months period, and if you go below that commitment, you are ineligible. And if you don't vote it during that three month period, you're also ineligible. So essentially, it's incentivizing people to have a stake in the game, uh, hold for three months, vote, and even propose proposals to be voted on. And then at the end of the three months, you get a reward. And I believe currently it's about seven or eight percent for the current iteration of governance. And I believe if you go through a couple DeFi methods, it gets up to like ten or twelve percent. Okay, so it's, so it's like staking, but then you actually also have to be active and voting. Yeah. You can't just be pat. Then you, you'll you'll lose your stake if you don't if you don't vote, and then you get a reward app. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people are a little uh, confused by that because when they first entered Algorand or where they first heard of Algorand, they had what are called participation rewards, which I thought were phenomenal. Where you literally did just hold Algo and you got like slow dripped every day a six percent or about six to eight percent reward just for holding. Uh, which was fantastic in a way to get people into Algorand. But over time, they wanted to change that reward model from a passive model of just holding the token to a more active model where you know they created this on-chain governance and they shifted that reward model over from participation rewards to governance rewards in which you have to participate in 
the voting process. And it's very easy. You know, usually there's two or three measures during each period it takes, you know, maybe one minute tops to vote because it's a, it's the speed of, you know, reading the measure, deciding your decision and sending a transaction. And the speed of Algorand is about, you know, one second, really, it's about a three and a half second uh, finality, but really, it just feels like a blink of an eye. So your your transaction sent your vote is sent. And it's easy as that. It's yeah, if I send like $30 on Algorand, it, it's literally like less than one cent of the fee. And it's immediate. Yeah, I mean, it's it, by the time you can open up the app and check it's our it's already there. Yeah, now, why anyone pays for things with, with Ethereum is just beyond me. I think they just don't know how faster and how much cheaper it is especially. Absolutely. And that's the thing. When I first got into crypto, I actually was won over by Ethereum. It was back in 2017. And, uh, you know, I heard of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was cool and all. I, you know, I thought it was very interesting, but it wasn't until the idea of smart contracts that I was like, you know, this is really, really interesting. And we could we could get rid of a lot of intermediaries uh, that exist today that are just kind of siphon money between two parties and that really provide little value. So I thought it was really cool uh the concept at least and then i used it for you know a year or two and during the 2017 2018 ico craze uh e even people back then were aware of the issues of ethereum so there were a lot of ethereum killers that launched during that craze like neo and tezos and you know a bunch of other ones and uh you know fast forward to today those issues still exist and then i stumbled upon algorand because i've always been searching for you know better platforms that you know, deliver on the promise of Ethereum, but in a scalable way that everyday users can actually afford to use. Uh, and that's, of course, how I came across Algorand back in 2020, I believe, 2021, something like that. Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize Algorand is kind of newer. It's uh, they did their big uh, SAFT or not SAFT like ICO in 2019. They hit right. exchanges, I think, in very late 2019. So they're not one of the 2017 but yeah, no, I remember Neo. Yeah, what the hell? They were like all the rage in 2017. Yeah. What the hell happened to them? I'll be honest. I loved Neo. I thought it was really yeah. cool. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I probably still have a little bit on a wallet somewhere that I just haven't opened up. I really have no, I really have no idea. But uh, I, it, from what I understand, it's still processing a bunch of transactions. I think it's like still like number 50 or something around that range on coin market cap. It's, yeah, they're they're still in the top 100. Um, and they were like they were like the Terra Luna back in 2017. Their founder, I forget his name, he was very charismatic, just like Do Kwan. It's a very Asia sort of a community right there. Remember, uh, remember like Wan Chain, Walton Chain. Remember those coins too? Yeah, I got into yeah. those. Uh, what was yeah. it? There was another one. It was like Dragon Chain, and I was just like, yeah, I, there was I, a Dragon Chain. Yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> I definitely got into that one as well. Honestly, I was talking to someone earlier about how I kind of missed the ICO days. Like it was the wild, wild west, and it, it probably shouldn't exist anymore. But it was a fun time in, in the crypto industry. Never again will there be a time where a project could just literally raise fifteen to thirty million dollars just putting up a website, and if maybe going to a conference or two was amazing. Right, right. I mean, people, uh, you know, create analogies from the recent crypto bust to the dot com bust, and like, you know, things like we uh, pets dot com. All you had to do was throw up a website, and and you had a, a fantastic business that was pulling in billions of dollars. But I, I really think that was closer to the two thousand seventeen ICO craze because you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, basically, all you had to do is say like blockchain and throw up a website that said something about smart contracts and uh, have a token sale, and uh, things were fantastic. It was, yeah, for comparison purposes like Binance, they actually did do an ICO public sale during the 2017 right. craze. They only raised $15 million. That was known as like the lowest ICO ever. Everyone would always ask CZ, so why'd you raise such a low amount? Like, like well, you know, we don't want to deal with too many investors or whatnot, but puts it in perspective there. Now, let's, uh, let's go back to Algorand. So, which, like, I can barely keep up with their Twitter page because it is so many like ecosystem announcements. It is, robust definitely one of the more underrated uh projects if not maybe even the most underrated um so wh which like dApps are you like the most excited about yeah see this is a really loaded question loaded i think question. because yeah. uh oh, sorry there's a little bit of echo i just heard but mm -hmm. uh yeah so it's a little bit of a loaded question because the ecosystem as you said is growing rapidly and it, even from somebody that tries to pay attention to it and cover it on a news perspective i can't keep up with it but uh, I suppose I'll have to start with the apps I use basically every day. So I use uh, an app called Lofty AI, which uh, allows you to invest in real estate, you know, cash flowing real rental properties uh, that are tokenized on the Algorand blockchain. You get your rental income uh, dripped into your account every single day, which is fantastic. Um, 
what else? AlgoFi. AlgoFi is probably, I think, I believe it is actually the leading application on Algorand in terms of TVL. I think it's, uh, you know, uh, I believe it's actually even in the top 100 uh, apps overall in terms of TVL across all of blockchain. But that's a lending platform as well as an Algorand governance vault, which allows you to participate in Algorand governance while also leveraging that money, which is fantastic. Uh, it's a decentralized exchange and it also has some staking and farming options. So all around, that's a fantastic application. What else? There's Folks Finance, which is another lending platform that does things a little bit differently, uh, but they also have a governance model that allows you to participate in Algorand governance through a creation of uh, G-Algo, which is kind of like uh, uh, Lido's liquid staking for Ethereum, where you have staked ETH, uh, STETH along with ETH. A uh, similar thing here, we have G-Algo for Algo. Uh, you can mint it and unmint it at the end of each governance period every three months. And uh, what else? I actually have a list here of all sorts of platforms that I'm really interested in. Ooh, one I want to mention is Milkomeda, which I haven't used too, too much, but they just recently launched. And this is an L2, uh, well, essentially an L2. It's uh, it's it, it's branded as the Milkomeda A1 rollup, which is an Algorand uh, EVM rollup, which essentially allows Ethereum virtual machine applications to be built on Algorand, which is really a, a mind-blowing iteration. So we have two applications that just recently launched called Brightside and BlueShift. So they're launched on the Milkometer A1 rollup. And members of your audience that are part of the Cardano ecosystem might be aware of Milkometer because they also launched a sidechain on Cardano that links Cardano to Ethereum, essentially. A little bit different there because theirs is a sidechain where ours is a rollup. Uh, but uh, effectively similar idea where, you know, creating both chains to be EVM compatible. Outside of that, I, the list could go on. So I'm going to have to shout out the people over at OneCircle. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of who OneCircle is, but they, they create this amazing ecosystem graphic about once a month that has like every single application either on mainnet currently or about to be on mainnet and that graphic gets huge like it's it's uh you have to really like zoom into it to really see all these uh, different projects that are building so go check out one circle and uh, uh you'll, you'll see everything else i missed to i forgot to mention today yeah that's a great sort of detailed uh roll up yeah the, the milgamina roll up in terms of the comments in my previous videos the developers or whoever's commenting they definitely seem very excited about that one Absolutely. And I had the, uh, the the CTO of DC Spark, which is the company uh, behind the Milkomeda, uh, you know project. Uh, I had him on my show maybe four to six weeks ago. So if anyone wants to learn more, definitely, I don't want to plug too much, but definitely go check out that interview because I am, I'm really excited. But I really do think that the future is multi-chain. And one of the, I don't want to say problems because the uh, Algorand virtual machine is fantastic. And I do think it's better than the Ethereum virtual machine. But one of the issues is that Algorand isn't EVM compatible, so all these other chains get to benefit off the ability to essentially copy and paste an application uh, from EVM and bring it over to their side. So a lot of the leading, uh, you know, a lot of the leading blockchains out there are EVM chains because of the ease, uh, ease and ability to port an application from one to the other. And since that's where all the liquidity is currently, uh, I, I think it's certainly a good move to have that. Okay. Nice. Nice. Now let's, uh, yeah. Uh, JT invests in you all in one word. That is his uh, YouTube and Twitter page. Check that out and see so, yeah, how let's go along with that. So you've had some pretty uh, good guests on your show yet. You uh, Anthony yeah. Scaramucci, you've had Stacey Warden, you've had Kristen Auger Hansen. Let's, let's go with the, so were you like a little intimate? Like, I'm just like in awe of this guy, a little bit afraid of him too. Like, like, were you like a little intimidated interview on this guy or you know, it's so interesting because, uh, you know, he is a controversial figure, of course. Uh, for, th for those that don't know, he's, you know, one of, if not, uh, I don't think he is the, the richest person, but he's one of the richest people over in Norway. And uh, he was a fun guy to talk to. I'll give him, I'll give him that. Uh, I don't want to get into any of the controversial topics because there's a lot of YouTube uh, interviews and videos that have already done that. So, you know, all that stuff's out there. But I, I, I probably, I was nervous. I was, I can't say that I wasn't nervous, but the more and more I do these interviews, the more I realize it's just a person on the other side of a screen. Uh, maybe it would be more nerve wracking if I was in person, like in studio, but I, I feel like it's easier to kind of disassociate from those nerves when it's just like a computer screen. So uh, overall, I wasn't too, too nervous. I was really excited and uh, kind of surprised he agreed to come on the show because he's such a big player, but uh, you know, very, very glad he did come on. And uh, I thought it was a good conversation. 
He, yeah, at one point, at least he had a net worth of two point five billion dollars. I think he probably is still a billionaire. He's just a general venture capitalist. And what is he a is he an investor in Al Grand or what's his connection? Yeah, he recently started this uh, you know venture capital launch called Algo Ventures, which is essentially trying to uh, incubate and help uh, prop up all sorts of various Algorand projects that they find interesting. Okay, okay, nice. And then yeah, I, it's always like this joke because. With the, so he's a big fan of uh, Craig Wright. And I've always said, like, just for whatever reason, anyone on the Craig Wright debate, no matter what side they're on, a fan or a hater, it's just the most dynamic, hardcore personalities only. Yeah. Then Kristen, I guess, is he's uh, best friends with with Craig and he fits that to a T. Just right. more hardcore. Right? I don't know what some, just saying about that guy, Craig Wright. Anyone involved in that debate um, is just only dynamic personalities. Yeah, and I'll say full uh, full disclosure. I do not agree with what he said on my on my show, where he said uh, that he believes Craig Wright is Satoshi. I don't. I don't think that's the case personally. I don't think uh, whoever created Bitcoin is still alive with us. I don't think. Uh, I don't think they're with us anymore. Uh, but that's my personal belief. So you know, I didn't want to challenge him too much. We're all allowed to have our own personal opinions on that. But I, I will say, I'm not. I, I'm not in agreement there. Yeah, you're just not going to win challenging on that. Yeah, I, I, right, I believe right. Craig was one of the initial. My opinion is I think Satoshi was the handle is shared by four or five different people. I do think Craig Wright is in that initial four to five person group. I don't I mean, it, it, he hasn't been able to move the funds or sign its key yet. So I'd have to assume that probably the public key went down or uh, the private key went down with um, the guy who died in 2013. I forget his name. Um, right. And th and there's no doubt that he was, uh, you know, very early on. There's, there's messages yeah. that go as far back as basically the creation, the beginning of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, unless it's that, uh, unless it's just like a group, then I could see that. I could see that as a plausibility. But I, I personally still hold a, a, hold a little strong that I think uh, Satoshi is no longer with us. If it, But yeah, it's a, uh, Hal Kleiman. That's what I'm thinking of. Yes. Yeah, so he died yeah, in 2013. Hal. He does appear to be the number one sort of leader in terms of the uh, people most think is probably him. So I believe that the private key did go down with him when he died. That's why the funds haven't moved. But I do believe Craig Wright is in one of those four or five initial early adopters, you could say. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so now let's, uh, yeah, let's do a little pivot here. So some of the big news for today, so, sort of some uh, comical news here. So what is going on? The Sam Bankman Freed <laughs> in Carolina, there was a rumored sex tape was supposed to be released today. 3 p.m. I'm still not seeing anything. Um, do you think this was this hacker guy bluffing, or do you think he's going to come through, JC? Well, I, I don't. I don't know about you, Ben, but I haven't been looking for it, so I, I can't. <laughs> I I, w I wouldn't have been able to confirm if it if it had been out yet or not. But um, unfortunately, I've had a really busy day, so I haven't been on Twitter too much. So uh, glad to <laughs> glad to know it's not out there for when I open up my app. I don't want it to just uh, <laughs> my feed be full of that. But I don't know. It's. Uh, I hope it doesn't come out. I hope he's bluffing. I hope it was just a bluff because I know personally I don't want to see it, and I know it's going to fill the news feeds. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I don't know. It's, yeah, I'm down to like read the tweets about it from people who watch it. It will be funny. There's no doubt that there'll be some, uh, you know, a lot of good Twitter comedy. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. I guess the hacker guy released still photos as a, like a proof of stake that he did on the <laughs> video. No one took him seriously. So he released the photos like two days ago. Uh, he's not demanding any ransom. He just to counteract the positive attention he's saying from the New York Times article, he wants to release some embarrassing negative attention. <laughs> that, you know, never a dull day in crypto, never a dull day. Yeah, ne never a dull day indeed. And you know, that's a, uh, you know, going back to the New York Times article, that was so strange. They basically wrote, uh, you know, a puff piece for Sam Bankman Freed. And then uh, Forbes today, I saw a headline. Granted, the article itself was a little bit more hard hitting, but the headline in the front picture was uh, the very first words were Queen Caroline. And it was like a like a beautiful like drawing or painting of, of Caroline. And I'm like, what 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 are these headlines? Like, what are these pieces? I, I, I don't really know what's going on with the mainstream media these days. It, it, it's pretty bizarre. It, yeah, I mean, you know, when your dad is the head of the economics department at MIT, Carolyn Ellison, her dad is the number one head of the economics department. That probably plays a role. Sam Bachman Freed's parents, big on the Stanford Law uh, professors. So, yeah, that, but yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, going into the FTX, it's, it's got a very Boston feel to it because Carolyn Ellison, she went to New North High. That's a suburb of Boston. Sam Trabaco, the co founder for Alameda, who was ousted in May, he went to Weston High, and Sam Bachman Freed went to MIT. 
So yeah, I'm waiting for like the Boston Globe to write their article on it. The Globe is known as maybe like the second best newspaper in the U.S. behind the New York Times. They have not really written a piece on it. But what are you excited for that? Like I am. I've actually seen that there were maybe at least one or two articles written by the Boston Globe over the last couple hours. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to click on them because they're behind a paywall and uh, I didn't get to read them. But I did see that uh, when I just doing a little bit of research not too long ago, that there were some articles from the Boston Globe. So if you can get behind the paywall, definitely let me know because I'm curious what they say. But yeah, those Boston connections do run deep. I mean, MIT especially, and even outside of crypto, I was I was doing some research on this. Apparently, there was a lot of money allocated to like funding all sorts of various science research. And uh, there's a lot of like scientists and like funding groups that are you know stepping down from their positions because they're no longer getting this money, or they've promised grants to people that they and they can't cover that money. Uh, so that that's really interesting too. I'm not I'm not really sure, uh, you know, why he was spending his exchanges money on all these random side projects that had nothing to do with crypto, but that's, bes that's, I guess, beside the point. Yeah. He had like ADD, like he's, he's a, like he's a hardcore trader at heart and he's got his politician causes and his charitable causes. Then just all these other side projects. Right. He was the second biggest donor to the Democrats right beneath George Soros, which is uh pretty wild. Honestly, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Are they, so are they going to have to like return that money or not? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's never happened before this sort of situation. So, yeah, so I, 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 people outside crypto, I just don't think they understood. Like, it, people in crypto were just terrified of FTX, specifically on the Alameda side. They just entered and exited positions so fast. Uh, you know, they had a tendency to sort of, uh, you know, kind of just annihilate their enemies completely. Anyone who is a dissenter, anyone who is the competition, um, and people were just terrified of them. Whereas Coinbase and Binance had never had a reputation for playing dirty, never. Um, so it, it really just reputations do kind of turn out to be true. I, I, the FTX side, like I, on the Alameda side, it wouldn't surprise me. I could kind of seen them blowing up the way it did, but I never expected any co-mingling of funds. I thought FTX was just smooth sailing. That never, right. you know, you, you agree with me there? Yeah. I don't think any of us saw this coming to at least this degree. Now I, I, I hold my reservations about most centralized parties in crypto. I do think Coinbase is probably the most reputable of uh, centralized exchanges, and and you're right, Binance hasn't participated in uh, you know those sort of aggressive tactics before. Although they do have, uh, you know, there has been some questions on uh, users losing funds and had there having been like no customer service at Binance to get anything back. But uh, that's a whole different uh, topic. But. Uh, Going back to FTX and Alameda Research, uh, I really don't think any any of us saw the scale of what was going on. Uh, we we suspected shady things, of course, to some degree at least, but uh, to the point of like having a ten billion dollar hole on the balance sheet, like where, like how is that even possible? I really don't understand. And uh, you know, it makes sense for maybe people like you and I who aren't going through the nitty gritty. But I, I keep thinking about all these big money investors like uh, Kevin O'Leary, and you know, you mentioned Anthony Scaramucci, and all of these other people. Uh, where was the due diligence? Like, I, I feel like if 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 somebody performed good due diligence before they just like you know had you know gave FTX their money or vice versa, uh, this probably could have been avoided a while ago. But it kind of seemed like everyone was just blinded by his charisma and the amount of money that was sloshing around to really do that do, uh, deep due diligence. It's yeah. One thing I noticed a lot of the money started flowing and deals started closing right after their big Bahamas conferences. So that shows yeah. me something about being in person around him, his charisma, the whole community, the whole scene down there, people just leave energized, enthused, just, they saw the vision. They probably sort of, sort of scrounged on the due diligence basically. Yeah, that's the way it seems. Honestly, it does. Uh, I mean, if you take people on, uh, at face value for you know what, the, how they're responding to this, it does. Uh, the the common uh, phrase that you're hearing is that people were charmed by him. They really were caught up in in his vision, and uh, that's still kind of mind blowing to me that uh, people, even of such high uh, caliber in the investing world, still were kind of blinded by emotion. Which you know, everyone says that you shouldn't invest and trade on emotion. Uh, yet, even some of the biggest players in the in the game still do. Yeah, these were not like rich retail investors who have never done due diligence. These were the Kevin O'Leary's of the world and some of the right. top. Uh, Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Wonderful, Sequoia Capital, huge uh, Silicon Valley VC. So, and if you're watching Kevin, I you know, it's all in good. It's all in good fun. I'd love to have you on the show. I'm sure Ben would too. He seems like a natural fit for your show, especially coming after Scaramucci, uh, Stacey Warden, you know, I think 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm always open. I, there's no gotcha interviews here, but uh, we, we certainly want to get to the nitty gritty of things. We do. Yeah. Ran Nooner seems to have a lock on the guy. Uh, O'Leary's on a show every single Friday. I have no idea how those two met, but right. if you're watching Kevin, JT invests in you, you can get on his show. You can go on this show too. But yeah, I think JT would be a good fit there. Absolutely. Absolutely. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that would be. Yeah. So I think we'll probably wrap up here. So anything else, anything else you want to plug anything else? You know what? If you uh, if you don't mind, I'll take a minute to you know sure. plug my socials, my YouTube, and all the all that jazz. Uh, so I know you mentioned at the top earlier. So JT invests in you on Twitter as well as YouTube, and I just want to let everyone know that I'm also part of a second show called The Next Block, which I host with uh, David called Crypto for Change on both YouTube and Twitter, as well as C Will uh, of the Passive Income Network on YouTube. Uh, so we all run that channel, the next block, and we're all going together to Dubai as a whole for that channel. So hopefully uh, we'll you know see some of your audience uh, in the comment section of some of those live videos that we bring from Dubai. Yeah, so that's November 28th to 30th. So JT will be there. So yeah, there should be some good comment there, uh, good content there when you're there, I'd imagine. Absolutely. And I think we're going to be there for an extra day or two because of some events going on before and after that aren't like officially uh, tied to uh, Decipher as a whole. So you know, there's going to be a lot coming out. I know there's a whole lot of guest speakers coming to Decipher. I know we didn't actually speak about it too much, but uh, some of what's coming to Decipher that I'm really excited about is, you know, the product roadmap with Paul Regal, the CPO. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, Supercharging DeFi, which is another panel with Ben Detto of Folks Finance and the head of Algorand DeFi. You've got a you know creativity panel with Dequency, LimeWire, Algawana, a whole bunch. It's going to be a blast. So really excited to get the next block out there and uh, bring everyone coverage. And Ben, I want to say uh, this was been this has been fantastic. It's been it's very rare that I'm interviewed. You know, I'm always sitting here interviewing someone else and letting them do the rambling. So it, it's nice to be on the other side and and ramble for a change. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and I hate talking about myself. So this worked perfectly. <laughs> I, I enjoy interviewing other people. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a change. I'm definitely better at interviewing people than being interviewed, but I, I hope your audience enjoyed it, and uh, I, I had a blast. You come across like a total natural in this interview, so you are good. Fantastic. So, great. All right. Well, thank. Just stay on for me one sec after I stop the recording here. But this is JT Invest in you. Be back on Monday with a new episode. Everybody, have a nice night. Take care.